Lacroix, and I'll be talking to you about triangulation of truth. And um, you know, it was great seeing the uh, presentation this morning, especially the, the last speaker, because he really set up a lot of uh, what I'm going to be talking about. And yes, about social media, but it's a lot more than about social media. A little background on our company. We're a brand consulting firm. Uh, my, my real passion is research. I love research. I work with uh, a lot of the people in this room, Ipso Reed, uh, Hot Specs, when they're just starting off, uh, Envirocell, and uh, you know, and we do a lot of work in the US. Our clients, TD Canada Trust, PepsiCo, ConAgra, um, uh, Suncor is another one of our clients, or PetroCanada. So we get involved in a lot of the uh, um, insights, and a lot of our decisions are driven by the insights. And, and so, you know, every, every month we're buying, we're involved in research, either driven by our clients or us going out. And uh, today's presentation is really about what's happening. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this provides kind of fodder for how you would approach your business moving forward, because the market is going to change. You heard this morning uh, that there are changes. You know, and I was listening to the previous speaker talk about panels, panels, and I think that's a great conversation to have. But to me, when I, when, when I was hearing him talk, I was thinking of our profession and how our profession, the design profession, started off, we were magicians. Clients didn't really understand how, how design worked. They didn't really ask a lot of questions. They just let us do great work. And um, it's like, it was the most fun part of a client's relationship was to go to the design firm. And then clients got really smart and they commoditized our industry and they divided creativity and pro product, production. And they moved production to people like Shock and Southern and they left to design with design firms. And I look at the research industry and I, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, you could argue that uh, research industry today is being commoditized. And I listen to panels, I'm going, wow, you know, interesting enough, I look at panels which really started, what, 10 years ago? I would say that panels today are kind of what telephone interviews were 10 years ago. And, I th and really the question is, what is, going to be, what is going to be the next big trend in research? And this is what I'm going to take you on this journey of what I call triangulations of truth. And what does that mean? It's, uh, I, I coined this, triangulation of truth is really when there's vectoring of different data points that validate the same message. And I would use a um, big concern about being a speaker the biggest speaker fear, you, you know what it is? I'm sorry? <laughs> no, 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 that's not the case. The big, the big concern we have as speakers is, is being the afternoon presenter when everybody in the morning contradicts everything you're going to present in the afternoon. <laughs> right? That's the biggest fear. And, uh, and, and triangulation of truth is, is really about these different data points that are converging, vectoring together to make to, to bring validation to what you're saying. And actually, everything that the presenter said this morning validates what I'm going to share with you this afternoon. But, and probably answer some of the questions that weren't answered by the uh, last presenter. I had some. So, so what I'm going to talk about is there's three trends happening in the marketplace today. One of them is, uh, you know, obviously, online tools. Where's the online tool? Where's, where's research going today? And how is this research evolving? The other one is really about this social media that you can hear a lot about. Uh, it really is redefining how we define research. And then the final one that no one's talked about uh, today is fact-based decisions. Come on in, fact-based decisions. And what are fact-based decisions? We're talking about how organizations are using information to make business decisions and how, how that process is evolving to, to, to new levels. And I'm going to start down this journey by first talking about what is the role of research? You know, if we looked at research today and you ask yourself, what is the role of research? You could argue it's about insights. It's about risk management, right? It's about providing, uh, you know, predicting future behaviors or relationship building. If you were to look at these, what do you think, what, what is research today? What do you think of where the research industry is going, what would you say? How many think it's about insights today? Yeah, insights, yeah. How about risk management? Yeah, absolutely. Pre pre predictor of future behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And relationship shape building. Yeah. I would say the research started off as insights 
And as the playing field evolved, it became risk management. Companies are using research to make a lot of decisions. Yes, I heard the research industry had a lull in the business. But as a business decisions become more complex and the risks become more incredible, uh, companies are looking at risk management. But I would say that that's been going on for the last five years. I think what we're evolving to is predicator of future behavior. And that's a risky area for research because research is traditionally, and consumer insights um, is all about what consumers understand and know. It's not about what they're going to do. You know, you look at Sony and look at the, uh, the launch of Sony Walkman. I'm old enough to tell you that I was there when they launched Sony Walkman. I worked for uh, an agency that handled the Sony account. And the research told us that the product would bomb because consumers could not visualize the future. They can base it on the past that these small little speakers would never communicate the same level of sound that these big, you know, huge speakers in your house, you know, that were this tall would create the same quality of sound. I think predicate our future behavior is a lot more about how the consumer engages with the information versus you engaging them. And it's this shift of control that we're going to talk about. And in relationship building, to me, research is evolving to really be a platform for companies to listen to their customers on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we'll talk a lot more about that at the back end of the presentation. So what we're here is redefining. So we started research really as a, uh, some of the challenges. There's a great book. How many of you read Freakonomics? What a great book. Huh? And, and, and again, the speaker before me really talked about the fact that we're talking to a select group of consumers who are already predisposed to participate in a research study. Right off the bat, that research is biased. I mean, really, because we've already, even though they, they, they represent the different cohorts and demographic psychographics of the marketplace, they already have a predisposition, so they're biased. It's really about attitude-based research that we're doing today. It's really about attitude. It's about a plan. You know, you plan a research. Well, we need two weeks for programming. We need one week for in the field. We need two weeks for uh, data poll. You know, it's all planned. It's not you know, ongoing, it's not intuitive, it's, it's planned. It's a major commitment by the client with a major start point and a major end point. It's semi-projectable, but we cannot, you know, you, you know, based on a sample validity, it's 10%, you know, it could be plus or minus 10%. You know, we see a lot of research that we've done where it actually does not track where the outcome was. It's interesting because consumers are being paid to even if it's $4 or $2 or $10, they are being paid to provide their comment. They're in an environment where they're not in the store, they're not buying their product there. And that's where you're seeing a big shift to ethnography research. There's a gentleman, a company that's now, uh, you know, doing research with their goggles. That truly is going to be part of the future of research is being with the consumer when the consumer is doing their buying decisions versus in this kind of world that's really not part of the stress. They're dragging their kids. You know, they're stressed, they've got to do five different stops that afternoon on a Saturday. Research doesn't factor any of those things in. What we're looking to is, is seeing a shift in having much more the customer control, which means that they participate. And we'll talk a little bit about the trends driving that. It's behavioral driven, so we are mapping their behavior. We really understand their behavior because we're, we're not tracking what they're saying, we're actually tracking what they're doing. And that's the big, divide in research. Research today really, to, to a greater degree, we track what they're saying and there's a big divide on what they actually do. And uh, I remember a study we did for SEAL test where it, when I started as a designer, we went out and uh, were uh, researching novelties and we had competitive novelty products and we had our product and we're getting them the taste test and give us, and they're all positive about this new product we're gonna launch. What we did is we left the freezer by the door and we said, well, you leave, just grab what you want. And we had our new product and we had a bunch of competitive product. And guess what? What was left was our products. And so again, you know, we really knew that we had a problem. It's real time, it's predictive, and it's immediate. I think those are the important things. That's where research is going. It's not just about panels. So I think panels are really important, but there's a bigger picture here that we need to keep in context. The other thing is I was reading a Forrester research document and they, they were asked, well, where is research going? You know, they did a big re report on where research is going and they said, you know, and you heard it again, you know, imports of global insights, you know, the whole industry is consolidating, you know, understanding how people 
their attitudes and behaviors in North America versus Europe plays an important role or in Asia. We're also seeing consolidation of research firms. Acquisitions are constantly going on and that will continue as, as, as to the degree of sophistication changes uh, and uh, the market pie is getting smaller, the bigger players are going to dominate and then you'll have niche players that specialize in certain categories. And then obviously growth of innovative research methods and uh, your par speaker talked a lot about that and we'll talk. If I were to tell you one trend that would improve the use of research, one thing you could do today to improve the use of research, what do you think it would be? One thing. Engagement, participation level, quality of the study. And we're talking, I'll just leave it online. What's the biggest business in entertainment today? Gaming. Gaming. It's, it's bigger than movies. The, the most recent release of Mortal Kombat outsold the big, biggest blockbuster in uh, movies, Titanic or Avatar now, right? There is an inherent behavior in gaming that we could leverage for research, right? But no one's doing it. The closest company that's doing it is Hot Specs right now with their Wheel of Fortune game that they play as you're, to break the monotony of the study. But very, we, we haven't seen a, a research firm actually leverage the inherent behavioral attitudes in, in how people participate online in, in virtual worlds, right? So anyway, it's just food for thought. So let's talk about social media. You're going to hear a lot of social media. I'm not going to delve a lot on that. This is a great quote that I like from Jean-Philippe Maheu from Ogilvy. And really what he talks about, only brands need to have a role in society. The best way to have a role in society is to understand how people are talking about things in real time. Isn't that what research is about? Finding out what people are saying about your brand, where, where their mindset is. You know, would they buy the product? What issues do they have the product they have now that you can improve? Let's look at what's happening here. We have two billion people online. You know, if you're a researcher, this is great. You're, the world is no longer doing research with a panel of two million. You actually have two billion people. If you have the right forum and you have the right vehicle, you can talk to two billion people. Now, I wouldn't want to pay $2 for every completed survey. I'd go broke, but obviously, there's 28% of global penetration. There's 50 tweets a day, 50 million tweets a day. Interesting enough. And there's 500 million on Facebook. So what does this tell you? What well, tells you here that the people who are living online are actively participating online. This is not a passive sport. This is not a passive environment. These individuals are providing content. They're uploading their pictures. They're sharing their ideas, their, their, their opinions with their friends. You know, LinkedIn is a great a great tool, you know, and when you, when you add a new friend or a new business associate in LinkedIn, how many have a LinkedIn account? You should all have it. It's great, it's great for your uh, resume, too. Keep, keep shopping. Um, the, um, uh, what's interesting is when you look at, they talk about the power of your network, you know, that you may have, like I have about 400 people in my LinkedIn network, but what it represents in the total network. Now think of the power of that for research if you can get advocates for your study because they're passionate about what you're selling. The network that they have, that they're probably not on your panel. There are people that may not participate in panel research, but have a very you know, clear point of view on, on input on something that you're researching. And these are the people we're not tapping into today. These are people that are now forming part of the panel. So part of that exercise is how do you grow your panel? Well, you create advocates online and you leverage their network, which to a certain degree, a panel does, but not effectively. The other thing we talked about is mobile. And mobile is growing dramatically. Uh, you know, we get approached constantly with firms that are doing now doing mobile research. What you have to understand with mobile is there's two dimensions of mobile. There's location-based, you know, having them opt in for location-based. So you're actually starting now to see predictive behavior because you're actually tracking where they're going. You know, Foursquare is nothing more the platform is nothing more than a big research study. Google is nothing more, Google Map, Google Map, that's nothing more than a research study. The first thing Google did when they had a lot of money, the first thing they did is they bought satellites. People thought, why are we buying satellites? Because we want to map where people go. And we want to understand the behavior of people in real time. We want to understand behavior of traffic in real time. Why? Because there's value in that knowledge. There's value in that in predictive behavior 
right? I open that store, right? They can actually now, you know, they haven't sold it yet, but they can actually now predict, they open a new store, what's the traffic happening around that store, you know? How many people are going to that store, right? What about the store across the street? They can map behavior, right? And understand that behavior and then do those algorithms to understand how, the, how does that predict? There's a great book called The Business Design um, by the, um, oh, now mental block. Uh, by the dean of, uh, of Rotman uh, of, uh, of marketing. And uh, he talked about three phases of technology. The first phase is discovery, which we do as designers. Then the next phase is validation, which is really prototyping it, making it happen. The last phase is algorithm. An algorithm is how do you automate that knowledge? And I think Google are in the automative phase of, and it's all about social media, and it's all about connecting via mobile phones. Somebody asked me, you know, you know, if we're going to do a research, you know, and how do we do this research? Do we do SMS or do we do web-based? Well, here's the fact. The fact is most consumers do SMS. They don't, they don't use their phones to browse the web. They use it for text messaging. So if you were to launch a research study, you'd be better off asking fewer questions with making a text message approach and having more people participate because you're now you're actually playing into a behavior that's already established versus forcing them into, you know, going to a website, which is, you know, even on a mobile phone, it's hard to follow, right? So, on, and we're seeing a lot of, you know, research platforms that are easier to follow and, and separate platform for mobile phone versus web, same as the, the websites for companies. So think of that. There's another kind of social media that's playing an important role is this, what I call the uh, convergence of truth. The best way of understanding where your brand stands is really understand what they're saying about it. So focus grievances, topic trending, you know, tantrum tweeting, these are all indicators about predictability of your brand, your brand strength, your brand equity, right? It's not just about meeting those key attributes that you have consumers respond to. It's really rating these, these elements in, in how you go to market and understanding. And you know, these are important metrics you can say, well, can social media be predictable? Well, let's take a look. The last election, 74% House candidates with the most Facebook fans won their, their contest. 81% Senate candidates with the most Facebook fans won their contest. And the granddaddy of them all is this gentleman, right? Look at the numbers. Obama, 500 million blogs. McCain, 150. Tweeters and MySpace, Obama, 884 versus 219,000. Huge difference. Did they really need to do research to find out he was going to win? Probably not. All they do is follow the tweets. Right? Now here's the, the challenge is as this becomes a sophisticated tool, it has to evolve because I think in the Canadian elections, I think the Liberal Party had the most votes, or the most, right, on Facebook. And I think they had the most visibility in social media and they didn't work. So as, the, as, as that technology evolves and that usage evolves, I think the most important trend I'm seeing that you should pay close attention to is this whole thing of crowdsourcing. That is a huge trend happening in the marketplace. It will have a huge impact on your client's business. And why I say that? Because companies like Dell, Nike, there's even a website called Crowdsource, Wikipedia. These are organizations that leverage the power of the internet to create online communities that actively participate in giving opinions on defining what they want. It's active. It's not something you put in the field once. It's something that they constantly talk about. It's a great way of finding out what is going to work before you launch a new product. I mean, we know that one out of 10, I think it's probably now one out of 50 new products fails or succeeds, the rest fail. Why is that? Because really what consumers will tell you in a focus group and an online is not projectable. What's projectable is what they ask that's not currently met. We've always learned in, in applying research that the most powerful element of research is identifying the consumer's unmet needs, right? I mean, isn't that what you tell you? I mean, the, the holy grail of, of success leveraging research is defining that unmet consumer need in the marketplace and delivering it. These are tools, not by research firms, these are tools to define the unmet consumer need states in the marketplace that are not being met by these organizations, but also not being met by the competitors, right? And that's what social media has. It has this ability to define. So what's the other side of that uh, triangle of truth? It's really the fact base. 
huge movement at foot today. Number one question in boardrooms today, how is my marketing working? Right? They used to say, you know, the old adage I think was, uh, I know that 50% of my marketing spend is working, I just don't know what 50%. Well, that is long gone. That end, you can either have two of the three, fast, cheap, and quality, that's long gone too. Clients want all three today. But let's talk a little bit about fact-based. What's happening in the marketplace? This is a great quote. I use it for, for my company. What gets measured gets done. What gets measured and fed back gets done well. And what gets rewarded gets repeated. And if you think of you know, creating these online communities, is not what this is, right? And, and we talked this morning about being rewarded. I think it's the same thing. What is that level of reward? It can't be ubiquitous. It can't be $4 for everybody. It has to be something that, you know, somebody will put greater value if you give that $4 to, you know, a charity or a social cause than getting the $4 in their pocket. But we choose to give them $4 because it's easy and convenient. So it's really about understanding these dynamics. So here's what's happening in the corporate boardroom. Here's the questions they're asking themselves. It's not about growing more customers. It's about getting deeper with the customers they have. It's about leveraging their network. So here's the reality. Our client shoppers, Drug Mart, I think they know really well. They probably know better who their customers are than anybody in this room will ever do, no matter what I'm out of study, because they track behavior, right? I would argue that Sobeys would, would track the same way. They have their, their credit card and, and, and their reward program, and they clearly understand where consumers' behavior, what's moving, what's not moving. What they're really interested in is how do we build stronger relationships? How do we grow our share wallet with our current customers, right? And companies are asking themselves the same question. How do we grow our share wallet? How do we build stronger uh, customer relationships? And how do we make those decisions faster? You know, this idea of waiting a week to make a decision on what's working in the advertising with social media, with digital media, with online, we can change that message quarter. We can change it from today to tomorrow. So we need, we need metrics and information. And what's popping up is a new model of making decision. This is from Microsoft. And it really starts with measurements at, at the beginning of the exercise. It's defining the KPIs before they even do anything else. You know, it's, and so when you're going into a client and asking them about research, you know, the, really understanding what those KPIs, were, which are beyond, beyond kind of trial and awareness, intent to purchase, you know, ability to refer. These are KPIs about what, what do you want to do? You know, is it growing your current base? You know, by how much? It's really getting understanding what you're trying to do. It's the analysis, it's the feedback tools. And those feedback tools are getting more and more sophisticated because people are realizing that the data points, triangle is true, come from various points in the marketplace. They don't just come from, you know, an online study of awareness level in my ad campaign or what my sales guys are telling me are happening in the field. They come from a lot of other data points. Because a lot of what today's fact-based decisions are based on are decisions that happened two weeks ago, right? Or, or three weeks ago, or a month ago, or two months ago, right? And obviously, from there, it goes to insights and it goes into action. And so what are we seeing? We're seeing new kinds of, of tools in the marketplace, new kinds of tools. They're called dashboards. They're called marketing dashboards. And large software companies like Siebel are developing these programs that integrate, aggregate, social media, sales, advertising, statistics, even behavior for their staff, understanding where the mindset of staff, because if you're a retail network, your staff behavior is a big predicator if that program is going to be successful or not. If they're not buying in on the program, right, they're not going to be successful because the consumer, that, that sales force is, is the contact point between the brand and, and the network. And so you see an example here, and Siebel actually track social media in this dashboard. And this is a company dashboard, and where the executives can look at, by day, what their brand's doing, and, where, and how is that impacting their sales. And why is that important? Fast decisions. They can move very quickly. They don't have to wait five weeks for a study, or three weeks for a study, or two weeks for a study. They have to wait a day. Yeah, so, so we have, a thing, uh, we have a, another model that's called the engagement model. The engagement model has three factors. One is process, message, structure, right? Very often companies get really hung up on 
message and making the message right, the right tonality, the right offer, but they fail to f forget structure. You know, if a customer asks the question, how are the staff going to respond? And, and very often the staff says, I don't know what you're talking about. I'll have to talk to my manager. Or I'm not clear about the offer. Let me find out, right? Well, again, there's a moment of truth that has failed because the communication link, right, in the process didn't work. And that's what I'm talking about, is really tracking if, if a company has a bad culture, and, we, and you heard this morning from John, I mean, the whole thing was about vision and aligning everybody and having everybody buy in on the vision mission. Well, if that vision mission wasn't bought in properly, do you think the Olympics would have turned out the way they did? Absolutely not. And so a lot of companies now are, are starting to analyze, and I'll show you a tool that another company is using, analyze their, their what they call employee value proposition, how the employee perceives the company, and especially these companies who have staff facing customers. You know, we talked to the banking industry, the service business, the wireless industry, right? Even, uh, even a lot of categories like pharmacists, the pharmacy, or even the supermarkets, uh, they have a lot of staff that face the customer. It's really important to understand where their mindset is and where their level of engagement, because that's a huge impact on the outcome of the program. And companies are monitoring that. All those dimensions of the brand we call moments of truth. And those are the smart companies. And everything plugs into one dashboard. Talked about, this is a, uh, this is a service. In the US, I just found it, OVC. Uh, you know what they do? They monitor staff engagement levels. The company actually, they deliver what they deliver. Simplified information, dashboard. What's the big challenge in the business you're in? The biggest challenge, I can tell you. You deal with tables. Really, really confusing, complex information, right? You know, typical questionnaire is what? 30 questions, 40 questions. And then you start dividing that by cohorts, by age groups, by demographics. It gets really complex. What, what is clients looking for? What's, what's the thing? we're all looking for, and that's simplicity. And, and whoever can come up with a simplest, simpler way of communicating the message in a visual way, right, because not everyone's a researcher that you're presenting the, the findings to, uh, will do really well. And if you can convert that into a dashboard where they can monitor that on a regular basis, then you can actually start predicting the behavior, right, because you can see a pattern. You can't see a pattern if you do research twice a year, right? You can see a pattern very quickly emerging and it's, you know, obviously it's very simple, it's accessible, it's easy to use, and more and more companies are popping up doing this type. Are these research firms? These are software companies. Our industry, our biggest threat for the design industry is the people that we rely the most on. Apple is our biggest competitor. You know why? Because they're automating creativity. They're simplifying creativity. They're allowing people who, don't, who aren't designers to be in the business of design. All right, so our competitor is not is the design firm next to us or the brand consulting firm down the street. It's technology, because technology is commoditizing our industry and it's commoditizing your industry. And you can see it here, because here's a software company that's in, in the research business, but they're not. We'll talk a little bit about that. Which leads to my other point, which, which is the other dimension of that triangle of truth, is what I'll call conventional research. Right? I think if you think of where your industry is going today, and you heard uh, it's in flux, it needs to change, panels is a challenge, you know, the validity of the panel is questionable, there are people out there who make a living participating in panels, right, and so are you really getting biased, unbiased, sorry, uh, findings, or are you getting, you know, are you getting the same kind of quality you'd get in focus groups? It was interesting, I was reading a, a book called The Brand Gap, it was written by a design Designers, definitely, it's an easy read. It's about 150 pages worth of read. Helmet, and I can't remember Helmet's last name. Uh, but he talks about research, and he talks about uh, that they, you know, they do a lot of work with P&G and Microsoft, and they found out that small samples are as projectable as large samples, that they found there was no big difference between small samples and large samples. You can start seeing why. I mean, because, you know, it's the same people doing the samples. It's the same people participating from one study to the other. So let's talk, look at and this is a great quote. I probably offend a, f a couple of people here. Many managers think they're committed to the organization to evidence-based decision-making, but have instead, without realizing it, committed to decision-based evidence-making. Right? And, and isn't that true, though? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, 
are those the attributes that are really driving the category truly? Okay. Are they? Right? And when you have 20 attributes or 27 or 34 that I've seen in some of the studies, or are we getting burnout and they're just going through the motion? Right? Scary thought, right? And so really, how do, you, how do you get down to that? Well, obviously in our industry and in your industry, uh, you're getting commoditized. Here's some examples of Taluna, SurveyMonkey, you know, they made fun this morning, Poll Daddy, Zoomerang, Survey Methods. This is just a few of these uh, commoditized research. And now they're they're linking up with panel groups. So now you can actually do a survey monkey. You can do a survey monkey for five thousand dollars, fifteen hundred consumers in the target group panel you want, right? So you know, are we seeing the value of research going down? Are you seeing this being commoditized? Yes. Not all bad because I've got some recommendations where the industry can go. You know, obviously, social media is now become a tracking tool. You know, how many of you actually provide social media reports to your clients? So when you're presenting the research report to them at, on key, key factors, you also say, oh, by the way, we've done this social mention, or there's a lot of other tools out there. And here's what we found out that collaborates, corroborates, or creates question about the study we did. Right? How many of you do that? Yeah, one. Yeah. So that's a, that's a scary thought because you know what? The research of the future is right here. It's right here. Right? It's based on a lot of data points that are not being paid to comment. Right? Active participation. Right? And the the more we create profiles of these individuals or more important, the information they're seeking, the more we have an understanding of what they're needing. And, and, and again, come back to research, it's all about defining that unmet need state. In everything we do, it's all about defining that unmet need state. Here are some tools out there for this. Here's just many, many tools that track relationships between networks and social networks. Right? Isn't that really what we're looking here is the future of panels, right here. This is the future of panels. You ask this consumer to participate in the study, and you give them an incentive to invite his or her network, and then that network comes over here and invites that network in, and that network, and that network, and before you know it, you've got a huge network of unbiased, you know, that are passionate about providing their opinion because they were invited by a friend, not by a research firm, right? We know that online, right, when we make buying decisions, we always go back to <coughs> a friend or a family member for an opinion. And I think this is a great example. <coughs> so we, we took the plunge. I paid $200 or $350. I went to Toluna. I said, let's give this thing a, a whiz. Uh, we interviewed 500 respondents. I put the questionnaire in the field uh, Thursday night. And I got the answers, you know, Friday morning, right? Bang, bing. 500 consumers. They, they slice and dice it. They tell me, and I get into a lot of detail, but they gave me a fairly rich for 350 or 400 bucks. Which was interesting. I asked the question, you know, how many of you participated in online research, uh, social media driven research? And 16% participated in social media research. 50% participated in social media polls versus surveys. What is that telling you? We heard it this morning is, is that that survey link, so the challenge for you is this. How can you get all the information that you want in five minutes? How do you get all the information you want in five minutes? Because that's about the, the, the time frame you have to play with. Right? It's getting faster, quicker. They want to spend less time. They're multitasking. How do you create, and how do you create that level of engagement with this community? Right? Because they participate, but they don't participate in surveys. When you keep on looking at this, we looked at, OK, what's the forum? A lot of them came from Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and then other was, obviously, websites would be another place that they participate. And obviously, you can see where the market is. But what's interesting is that Facebook was almost as, it's actually larger than, than uh, for the 16 to 34 year olds. And obviously for the 55 year olds, the more conventional is still the way to go. But you can see where that market is going. 
where the trends are happening. So all that, triangulation of truth, there's dynamics, fact-based, companies are looking for aggregates of all the information, not just conventional research, are looking at research from, from uh, the field, sales, statistics, social media mentions, you know, uh, cl cloud sourcing. And, and if you look at the companies like Dell, Nike, who have a lot to lose because they're very much a badge brand, uh, having those aggregates are key indicators if they're going to be successful or not. They really want to know before they do their September launch uh, for back to school period that they've got products consumers really, really want. And with consumers now more and more wanting personalized, personalized products, it's important to understand how those products fit with different communities, if you like, of consumers. So what are the recommendations I'd have? This is a comment from Axe. When our Axe community gives feedback to an ad saying it won't fly with Axe's core demographics, the value is immediate. That's amazing. The value is immediate. And that's what clients are looking for. They're, they're looking for immediate information. Let me ask you a question. Do you find that you're getting pressure on the time frame of, a st of quantitative studies? So what's the average time you do a quantitative study? How many of you say five weeks? Raise your hand. Four weeks? Three weeks? So, so the rest of you are saying longer than five weeks? Six weeks, would you say? I think the big challenge you're gonna have is that time frame will continue to compress. With clients wanting faster, quicker information, that time frame will compress. I can tell you for sure, it'll compress. We're seeing it now with some of the studies we're doing. We put a study in the field last week. We're presenting the results next week. And this is a, a 1,500 national study. So this is not a small sample size. This is fast. Right? And you're going to see more and more of this. So the question is, how do you deal with that kind of speed? So let's talk. So I think as an industry, as professionals, you need to redefine insights. Right? right now, insights are um, a, a group of panel respondents. It could be online, it could be by phone, it could be mall intercepts, who, who are giving an opinion you know, in the comfort of their home. I think insights of the future are going to be a combination of things. I think they're going to be a combination of what is happening in the social world, in social media. It's going to, it's going to be also about what happens from a standpoint of employee engagement and the level of employee engagement, you know, understanding where, where their headspace is at because they are a key influencer on the success of any program. It's also going to be about how you deliver those insights. Right? It's going to be a matrix of information. It won't just be a study. Wouldn't you love to own that dashboard you saw from Siebel? Wouldn't you like to own that? In our industry, when we, uh, we noticed we got, the industry was getting commoditized, our focus was to, was to evolve our business to be more strategic, right? When you think of your business, you know, do we need to move upstream, right? Sklar Wilton, are they a research firm or are they a strategy firm, right? I think they're a strategy firm. I think they got it right. I think they got it right. How long, what's the tenure of their clients? Anybody here from Scholar Wilton? No? What's, what do you think the tenure of their clients are? It's like 20 years, 15 years, 20 years. Why? Because they became the indispensable consultant on their business, brand consultant on their business. They went beyond research. That's where you need to be. If you're in the research industry, you need to swim upstream. You need to be a consultant. You need to aggregate all that information and provide benchmarks and metrics. We did a big study in the US for a big retail chain. We used EnviroCell in the US. And you know what the value they brought? The real, real value? The real value, and it was ethnography. We're, we're tracking how people behave in the new, we had opened the chain, new concept stores. We wanted to find out what the behavior was and where they shopped, and did we change the way they shopped. The real value they did is they had benchmarks versus banks and our competitors. And they could tell us where we moved the needle and where we didn't. Right? They could tell us where we were weak and where we were strong based on benchmarks. I mean, you think of the amount of research you do and the insights you gained, the benchmarks you could create. Very often a client will ask me, you know, is a 60% a score a good score? I can't answer that question, but the research firm certainly can, especially on new products. You can know what that 
benchmark score needs to, where you need to break through to be very successful in that category. Is that research? I don't think so. I think that's, consult, that's consultation, that's strategy, right? It's helping them define the meaning of the insights beyond the insights. So moving upstream, I think, is a real opportunity. And I think firms who go beyond panel, yeah, you know, it's great to have panels, but go beyond that and look at new ways of building those insights and provide more consult consultation uh, will do very well because they will become indispensable in the way the client goes to market. They will become the knowledge center for behaviors, both uh, employee and consumer. And, and some of you in this room we work with who do both, who do uh, employee research and do also consumer research. And they're the smart ones because they can aggregate, you know, is, is the behavior within the staff affecting the behavior with the consumer? Number three is uh, integrate measurements and really bad, but dashboard. Wouldn't it be great if you came to a client and you said, listen, we got all these tools, but here's one tool we have for you. You can type in your name and password, and guess what? We have a dashboard that you can follow on, on where, what's happening in the marketplace about your brand, right? Like their sales, it's immediate. It's by day. They can see if there's a trend. President spoke at a, at a convention or did a public speaking engagement and a lot of chatter online that, that, that's positive about what they're doing or negative. You know, wouldn't that be great? Or negative comments about a new product they launched or great positive comments about a product they launched to understand, hey, we can build on this. These are the things that they're looking for. We can add a line extension to that product, right? But it's a dashboard. You heard it, uh, you know, thank God you said it, redefine community. I mean, you know, panels are not panels, they're really community. And it's really finding the junction of these communities and what their need states are and, and really delving more into how do you grow these communities, how do you create communities that are, have, you know, that are validated, uh, vetted, so that the input you get is accurate, pr projectable. I think it's very important to really define your communities. And, and it's got to go beyond demographics and panel size. It's also about behavior, you know. And the beauty is that, uh, you know, your competitor is Google. It will be Google. It'll be a software company. Anybody here doing research will be a software company because they're going to be able to aggregate the vectors based on consumer real behavior versus projected behavior. And I think for you is to really understand those and, and do the same exercise, maybe not as thorough or probably more thorough, and really understand what your communities are. The other thing is that you're going to have to share control because that's coming. And what I mean by share control is, is use social media to put it out there. And I know there's, uh, I think there's a, a presenter in the next room talking about how social media is not working for research. The big question, like a lot of things, is is it being done right? Is it mirroring the, the behavior of social media behaviors? Are we force fitting a tool that we've used online in a social media environment? We saw in, in the Toluna study that I just presented to you that it's more about polls than about studies, right? And if you're going to the market with, with studies, you probably won't get a good response because people are spending five minutes and then checking out. It's a very different world in, in social media than it is online, really. If you ever, how many of you have daughters that are like teenagers? You should check to see how many websites they hit in five minutes. It will blow your mind. It will blow your mind. They have the attention span of about five seconds. I think if they are in one spot for five minutes, phenomenal, but that's, you're getting pretty lucky. And that's what you're talking to in a lot of cases, is that generation that's growing up to multitask that has a very short attention span. And how are you going to talk to them and get them engaged? You got to get engaged by provide them the control and the conversation. And that's what social media has done: is allowed them to provide a voice in the marketplace. Our job as researchers is to mine that voice and make sure that we're getting accurate information. And apply, and then, being that we're, we moved upstream, is to apply that to some strategic insights. You know, for me, I look at you long term. If you're doing your job right, you'll probably be a competitor to me because you're going, to be, you're going to be the bastion of insights. 
So just look at where Insight started. 10 year, 15 years ago, who owned the client's thought leadership? Who was the thought leadership in the client's business 10 years ago? Advertising agencies, right? They were the voice. I mean, the client would go to the advertising agency and say, what do you think, Bob? Should we do this? And they would say, okay, well, let's, let's have a meeting. Let's discuss it. We'll bring in some researchers and we'll talk about it. And they, had the, they controlled the information. And that's actually shifted to what I'll call brand consultants because brand consultants are no longer tied to any type of medium. We're interested in the consumer and the consumer insights and the consumer behavior and how it applies to a solution. But the reality is, long term, that's what you'll be doing. You'll be providing the insights and the strategy that applies to those insights. So think about that. All right. I think this is, I, I talked at the beginning of my presentation, how can you fix online research today immediately to make it more engaging? I would say you need to make it more like a game. You need to borrow the behaviors. To be successful, it's not about forcing people to change their behavior. It's about leveraging their behavior right, to your benefit. Right? Tai Chi, it's about using that movement to your to your benefit versus force him to move. And I truly believe that, that making it fun for them, I mean, a study is not fun. I have to tell you, when I, when I, when I think of a study, I think of, I get, you know, when, when the elections were happening, I would get every night, five o'clock, right, or 5.30, you get a phone call. Now, I'm, I've got the lingo, I say I work for a marketing firm, so you can hang up and they figured it out. It's a great tool, we should do a little, but anyways, but you know, it's not, I'm doing it, and I've done it for uh, the bank industry. I did it once to find out what my competitor was working on, like one of the competitive banks was working on, so I pretend I didn't do marketing, and it's about credit cards. I'm sorry, but it was always interesting. But it was, it was not fun. It was not, a, I wouldn't rate that as, you know, if I had a choice between that and, uh, you know, surfing on the web or, or watching a TV show, it would, it would rate pretty low. But there's no reason why it can't be engaging. It, you could turn it into entertainment. Right, same. So make it engaging. And then think holistic. So data points. It's not just the you know the qualitative or quantitative study you're doing. Should you be looking at some ethnography research to track the customer? Is there another data point that's projectable on behavior? Don't think of the clients very often come to you, okay, we need to do this. They've already predispose what the tool is, you know, because they're very smart clients, they buy a lot of research, they know, but very often it's a matter to step back and say, you know what, I think they really get to this, because you're asking us not only to get some insights about current behavior, but projected behavior, I think we need to go into the home and really understand how the consumer behaves in their household. We did a big project what, eight years ago now with Tetley, and it was all about um, selling more herbal teas. And, uh, and we did research and, uh, you know, and we, 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 you know, different patch design ideas and stuff. And yeah, a couple ideas came to the surface. But it, it wasn't until we said, you know what, we need to go into the consumer's household. Because one of the customers made a comment in the verbatims that said, you know, you know it, it's, it's about freshness and it's about storage. And well, that's interesting. So we actually went and did some ethnography research in, in households. And we found out the big barrier to selling herbal teas is uh, that uh, consumption of herbal teas is much lower than consumption of regular tea, significantly lower, and it takes up a lot of room in the cupboard. Cupboard space is at a, at a, a premium, and so launching the round canister, we solved two problems. We ensured freshness, and we ensured stackability, and we added about 30% sales increase. But that's ethnography, it's data points. It's not just leveraging, because had we followed just the conventional research, online research, we would have gone down the wrong rabbit hole. And so holistic is a very important, and, and as professionals in the industry, it's very important for you to recommend more than what the client's asking. If you believe that ethnography research or eye tracking research, you know, the beauty today is the tools are you know, very inexpensive. I remember the first eye tracking study we did, it was actually with Claire Wilton, and they had this, this TV screen, and, it'll, and they put the, uh, a photographic image of a shelf, and then this person wore these cameras with these big cables and you couldn't move very well. And I'm going, how, how does that influence purchase? I mean, you know, it's, I'd get a headache just trying to carry that thing on my head. But now, right, it's a pair of normal glasses, it's Wi-Fi and a bing, you know, you put it in your pocket, you walk, 
like you normally would shop the store and you really understand where the eye goes. And it's all about, especially if you're selling product at retail, it's all about visibility, shopability, right? It's all about, you know, how you browse the shelf, all these key metrics that you really wouldn't get in an online panel. So it's getting cheaper and easier, but it's got to be holistic. So holistic is really the next thing. I think you also need to redefine listening. And you're really in the listening business at the end of the day. Insights is all about listening. It could be visual listening, but it's listening to what the customers have to say, or the target group. But I think you've got to redefine it, because it's, now it's listening beyond the conventional listening. It's listening from different data points. And it's ensuring that the, that listening, what you're trying to hear is what you want to hear. What you're trying to hear is what's important to, to the client.